Hello and welcome everyone. It's a pleasure to have you here. My name is Ted Belillis and I'm a partner and managing director at Alex Partners, where we have worked each year for eight years to create a private equity leadership survey. And today we have a real treat. We've got some wonderful guests to discuss our findings. And I'd like to move very quickly into introductions. Our panelists are Lane McDonald and Danny Levy, and I'm joined by my partner, Joanne Taylor. So Joanne, over to you for a quick intro and then to Danny and Lane. Thank you very much, Ted. And thank you to Danny and Lane for joining us today. I'm Joanne Taylor. I operate in our private equity and digital practices where I work very closely with uh, Opcos, uh, I'm sorry, uh, Portcos, as well as with our private equity teams to make sure that we're delivering all the support, insights, and value through the deal life cycle. Lane, over to you. Uh, Lane McDonald, I'm a managing director working with OMERS Private Equity, and OMERS is a Canadian pension, 120 billion dollars of assets that we manage on behalf of 560 pensioners in the province of Ontario in Canada um, and our private equity arm which we invest in um, control uh, we have flexibility to invest all over the capital stack but for the most part control middle market um, predominantly services deals although we invest in uh, business services industrials healthcare. Um, as well as software. And uh, I've just been in OMERS for a year and a half now. It's been a true pleasure, but have a, a long history in private equity after having a couple C-level stints and started out in consulting. Hi, everyone. Yeah. Danny Levy. Um, I joined Carlisle uh, over four years ago to, to help start our town and organization performance group. Um, Carlisle has uh, about 380 billion of, of assets under management with investors and operators all over the, the planet. Um, within our global private equity segment, we have a small but very mighty uh, global portfolio solutions team that works on um, driving value creation within our portfolio companies. As, as part of that broad global effort, um, I and my, te my team on the talent side have the privilege of working with CEOs and leadership teams, helping them think about all things talent. Uh, really looking forward to the discussion today. Great, great. Well, thanks to all of you. And, and let's just get right to it, to just say a few words about our eighth annual private equity leadership survey. We've been conducting this every year, as I mentioned. We, we ask, each year we ask over 200 operate, PE operating partners and Port Coast CEOs about a variety of topics. Increasingly, they've been about leading through disruption, and, and this year is no exception. We're going to be discussing our findings in, in just a, a second with Danny and Lane and, and kind of learn what they've been experiencing in their portfolio companies and hear examples of how they are tackling challenges. Um, also, there's the opportunity to submit questions, and we'd love to take questions you know, from the audience as we as we go through this discussion, so please don't be shy. Um, let me just uh, kick us off a little bit, um, Joanne, Danny, and, and Lane. And this is kind of a kind of a, at the risk of stating the obvious. You know, we hear a lot about the number of deals going down, and, and deals are taking longer, holding periods being longer, exits harder. Is this what you are continuing to see uh, in the marketplace? Any any changes? Any trends? where that's not the case or looking like it may not be the case? Lane? Yeah, maybe maybe I could jump in. Um, you know, I think in, in terms of kind of areas that are that are hot, right? Health, healthcare never stops, <laughs> A, and, uh, and B, I think, you know, I, I think we as an industry are trying to figure out what chat GPT and AI kind of mean. Um, so, you know, I don't play personally in the, um, venture capital or growth capital space, although we've got a couple funds under Omer's umbrella that do. Um, but of course, you know what, you know, maybe I could speak for for Danny, but speak certainly for for our portfolio. We're we're, you know, kind of deep trying to figure out what it what it means for us in our portfolio. But but market wise, yeah, I mean I think the you know the, the the paucity of deals over the past quarter and and kind of into the next month. I mean we're you know we have an advantage in that we've got evergreen capital, right? So we don't have the pressure to, to have to put money to work. 
Um, so, but yeah, the deals that we are seeing, you know, there's there's sweetheart deals going on on the pref side, on the credit side. And so having that flexibility to be able to play, excuse me, the smoke in New York is certainly affecting me today. <laughs> uh, but being able to play, you know, anywhere in the capital stack, I think has served us really well. And, you know, frankly, we haven't seen uh, deal terms on the pref side or the debt side as, as kind of lovely as they've been, let's say, over the past six weeks, two months, um, you know, since 2009, 2010. So it's been, you know, the kind of maybe one other thing to add in speaking with investment bankers, um, you know, I think everyone's really loading, you know, loading the gun proverbially to, to have a big back half of the year. But, you know, until the debt markets loosen up, you know, there's 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 going to be there needs to be an event that creates, you know, a, a loosening of the situation that we're seeing. But, you know, there's a lot of dry powder out there. So, you never you, you know, when it goes, I think it'll go go fast. What, what, what I've been hearing from our clients is that there's you know, it's, it's a very much a 2024 kind of event. You mentioned the back half of this year, which seems optimistic, um, kind of let, let's hope so. But maybe maybe more. Who knows? Who knows when? But um, maybe more a little bit into next year for sure. Yeah. Yeah, I, I absolutely agree. Um, we're seeing the same level of kind of pent up de demand, anticipation, and just a real level of competitiveness that's that's touching every corner of our business. Um, we're we're working to use the time real really well um, as we navigate kind of all this uncertainty and all this pressure, and have a very clear mandate from from the top, which is. Um, Exit, exit well and, and where possible, be really decisive in terms of where you're spending time and dollars and diligence and um, focus on the portfolio. Uh, there's, there's a tangible level of intimacy right now that I haven't seen before in my four years at Carlisle between our investors and, um, and our portfolio companies. And they're just getting an unprecedented level of, of support given the climate. That's great. That's great. Right, well, I'm going to go on to our next question. I think that, you know, as we think about the uncertainty, we all know that on any given day of leadership is super important, especially from an effective leadership standpoint. Um, what the respondents of the survey found, 70% of them said that leadership effectiveness is the number one lever for value creation. It topped the list. For both of you, what are you seeing as some of the best ways for investors or operating partners to support CEOs in this environment? And as you think about that as well, um, how are you working with them or what are you seeing in terms of helping those CEOs develop um, through the crisis? Danny, you wanna start? Sure. Um, wasn't surprised to see this stat at all. Um, I think we recognize that the first most important thing you can do is make the right investments. The other first most important thing you can do is, is, is support CEOs and, and kind of re really back them. Um, with every CEO, we sit down immediately post-close or post-hire to discuss kind of a range of tools that, that we have available for them. Um, and so we're often deploying things like executive coaching. We're helping them get the right scaffolding ar around them from, from a team and resources perspective. And um, also just making sure that they have, there's a real dialogue about what, what they need to, to be successful. And we're either providing that or removing removing the obstacles in front of them. Um, it, it may sound kind of simple, but I think that at a minimum, it's really important for investors to have real conviction about whether they have the right CEO in, in the seat. Um, I've seen too many situations where boards are unsure about the CEO, but don't have a real plan to make a determination one way or another. And so they enter into this highly unproductive state mm -hmm. of purgatory. Um, so we work hard to kind of steer, steer clear of that holding pattern and like recognize when we're lacking conviction, acknowledge it, understand the negative impact that this is having on the individual's performance, but also the business performance and make smart yes or no determinations. And by, by the way, like the answer here, when you're in uh, an uncertain phase with a CEO can be choosing to back that, that sitting CEO. I think that's a, a really great outcome. Um, I've seen situations where boards were mixed on a CEO and unwilling to like fully wholeheartedly commit to, to his success. And once they did the work of realizing that maybe this is not our ideal person, but this is the right person to, to get us to exit, um, it really unlocked a lot and got them way more focused on enabling that CEO instead of perpetually 
inspecting his performance and kind of bur burning calories on uh, that, that question of whether he was right. But what about the flip side of that, Danny? Do you see the opposite where, you know, and this, this happens very much when we go in and do our management assessment work and, you know, with, with Portco companies where you have to deliver the news that, you know, the man or woman in that seat is not really going to get you, it's going to, you know, not going to get you where you need to get to. And you actually have to kind of put some pressure, um, the board has to come forward and say, you know, we want the right person for the long haul. And this isn't the right person. I've seen, you know, B players backed, you know, far too often just because the board didn't want to disrupt things. And then 18 months later or two years later, they've regretted that. Have you, have you seen that? Oh, yeah. I, I mean, when, when is the last time any of you heard, man, we, we made that decision way too quickly. Um, on, on cow. It, does, it doesn't happen. And so I think this, that's why I call it this kind of this purgatory, or as Do Dr. Seuss would put it, like the waiting place where you, you know that there's something that probably needs to be done, but no one is willing to have conviction on what, what to do. And so, I, I mean, yes, we, we see that all the time. We also really early in an investment work to gather that data, do our own fact finding on kind of what's working, what's not, and what are the big capability gaps that need to be filled or kind of the, the key upgrades for, for the investment to be successful. So yes, Ted, wholeheartedly agree. Um, do, do it early and make sure if you don't know the answer, you have a path to, to figure yeah. it out. Rip, rip the Band-Aid off fast. Yeah. 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 Like, I, I, yeah, I was going to say, I couldn't agree more. I mean, I think the, as I think back over my kind of 15 years of doing, doing this job at different places, I mean, that that's the mistake is the hesitation. The purgatory is what's going to kill you. So either rip off the bandaid, find an interim solution, you know, and, and just move on it or, or commit behind the person, you know, who's sitting in the seat and do everything you can to, to support them. You know, our team by design is very senior, our operating partner group, excuse me, is, is very senior and very thin, right? There's not that many of us. So, you know, frankly, we don't have a lot of uh, capacity, let's say, to, to kind of step in as an interim, which has not always been the case. At a couple other places where I worked, we had kind of more arms and legs where we could provide that extra muscle. Um, so, so truly what I do all day is find a way to support, you know, our CEOs, right? And you know, when you when you kind of have the inkling that maybe this isn't the maybe this isn't the horse we want to be you know riding into this battle, um, you know you have to pay attention to those those instincts. But but of course you know no you, no one's ever read a deal memo that says you know we hate this management team and don't want to back them right. That's I mean every right. investment committee document says yeah. you know we're class management team on it. So you know ergo how do you get from I'm not sure this is the right thing you know from how do you get your deal partners to to kind of move along with you. Um, and so I think, Danny, what you're describing is exactly what we do. So we put, you know, get a third party assessment team to come in and really help us build the data. And, you know, frankly, um, I think I read this, frankly, in one of your surveys, Ted, as well, you know, management teams, I think at first, perhaps were a little bit um, suspicious of these assessments and these kind of deep dives, you know, it can feel like a proctology exam, you're talking about your you know, your middle school, you know, English teacher, et cetera. But um, I think that has changed dramatically in the past, let's say five to seven years where management teams are actually looking at this as a real opportunity for them to get feedback that, you know, they've been hungry for, right? The, to be a C-level executive is a lonely, lonely, you know, place to sit. Yeah. So to have, you know, true data-based, you know, third-party um, impartial, you know, feedback on kind of what you do well and where your gaps are. Um, I think we found management teams actually really, really accepting of this. And, you know, um, so the, of course there's the rip the bandaid off and, and kind of pull the team out, but there's also maybe perhaps an interim solution where and box in isn't the term I want to use, but you can support a CEO say, hey, here are the gaps that you have. So we're going to bring in, you know, a, a shoulder to shoulder, you know, if it's an executive chair, if it's a chief people officer with, you know, chief strategic officer slash people officer type of chops who can come in shoulder to shoulder if it's a COO, right? So building a team around them that specifically fills in the gaps. I think that, you know, I think it takes a special kind of CEO leader to be, you know, kind of open and excited about that, but again, worded in the right way and with enough trust built that, and with the, you know, reality that you're frankly saving their job by having this person come in and supplement them, you know, I think you can kind of build the right skill set with a few different chess pieces on the board that way. I, 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 
Go ahead. I was going to say, just from an advisor standpoint, I know that as we're working with our clients and I work with mine, there are, you know, our goal obviously is to have a positive, trusted advisor relationship where we can be really forthright with them on here's what we're seeing, here's where you need to be performing better um, in terms of leadership or, you know, outside of the, the results to some degree. Uh, I think. As we talk with our CEOs uh, that we're working with, I think one of the things that we're being very honest with, at least I am, is we are in a different environment. And if you think about the timing of when many of these executives came through ranks, they may have missed the prior downturn. And so what they're really facing for the first time is headwinds. And I think oftentimes having someone, an advisor, even as you all are supplementing with resources that you've spoken about from a the PE firm perspective, from the advisor standpoint of what we're doing is also being able to be there to, to help coach and guide and here are things maybe that you want to be thinking about differently and why. And, you know, putting them also in touch with some other folks within our network uh, that they can, in essence, have a safe conversation with uh, as well. So I just wanted to add in that a bit from an advisor perspective. Yeah, that's wonderful. I Go ahead, Danny. No, I, 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 I love that point, Joanne. I, I was, I think that especially for executives, I, I rarely see an executive who's going through a major moment of change for, for the first time. Usually there's right. some inflection point that's kind of fueled their, their ability to get to where they are today. But during, you know, during some of the um, transformative watershed moments that I see executives experiencing seemingly on the regular, right? Um, the investor or the invi advisor can come in and they can either choose to be a remedy or a judge to, yep. to that person. You know, the, the judge is in many ways like a really comfortable, familiar role for, for an investor and advisor to play. Um, and like by the by design, our investors are in the judgment business. And so mm -hmm. a lot of what's gotten them to where they are is their discernment, their ability to question. But when leaders are going through major moments of change or, or major crisis, like there is a role for the judge, but that that remedy is often what best supports CEO effectiveness in that moment. So the judge is kind of coming in and questioning, inspecting, asking for more and more and more data, which can often be um, a, a distraction when they're trying to solve the actual problem. Whereas like the, the remedy is really getting in the trenches, offering solutions and asking how they can help. And I feel like the more we see our investors or our operating advisors serving as that, that true in the trenches remedy, we're seeing real impact and we're also building a real partnership that allows us to understand what does the business actually need and, and not just what folks are telling us. Agreed. This is, this is just an incredible conversation. I, I, I really just have to mention that. And as somebody who leads a team that does management assessment every week, we've got three projects go on right now. I just want to highlight kind of the, the two different ways in which it can be done. And Lane, you alluded to this. I mean, you know, if, and you did too, Danny. I mean, if you're if you're if you're assessing the management team, if you're assessing the CEO as a judge, right? That that's that's where the analogy to the you know the the, the unpleasant experience really comes in. But when you provide feedback to that individual, it, even if ultimately he or she is not going to be on board for the long run, that that experience of feedback can do can work wonders both for the individual as, as well as for the cultural advance of that organization. And why is culture important? It's important, we'll get to this, I'm sure, in this, in this talk, because it attracts and retains talent. And so, it, you know, being able to, to your point, Danny, be the advisor, be, be truthful, be constructive, but there's no need to be judgmental, um, I think is extremely important. And that's where management teams come back and say, we like this. This is feedback oriented. We may not always like what we're hearing because it's truthful feedback, but it is data driven and it and it's ultimately supportive. And I think that's, you know, talk about getting the most out of your management teams. I think I see that as a, as a, um, I see that happening more and more in the last few years and, and, and needing to happen more and more. Lane, you're on mute. Lane, Lane, you're on mute. Good. I was clearing my throat. Good. I was I was going to say just to just to build on that. I, I couldn't agree more because I also think, 
you know, as, as Joanne, you pointed out, may, maybe some of these CEOs haven't been in seat before when things got really hairy. And so, you know, Danny, to your point, then you create an environment where you've got some, you know, deal partner breathing down their neck. You've got some, <laughs> you know, judgmental, you know, executive chair breathing down their neck, right? That That's not an environment where, you know, a leader can be successful, right? That's when she gets stressed and might kind of turtle in or, um, you know, some of her worst qualities might come through, right? Whereas if you create, I love this idea of the remedy, right? You create a, a remedy situation where, you know, we're all here to support you, right? You're you're our horse, right? We're in this war together. Let's get in the trench. You know, what are things that you can do? How can I be supportive? How can the executive share, you know, and just kind of make it feel on the CEO's behalf, like we're, we're there for her and we're on her team. Um, I think that's where, you know, it's exactly when you get the best out of folks and I'm kind of neck deep working with a, a CEO right now. I've been working with for, you know, pretty much since my, my first day at Omer's and, and to see the way this individual has responded to this idea of trust and support. And, um, you know, he, he has thrived in a way that I think has been unexpected to all of us who are the ones who put the bet on him. Right. And so, you know, I expected him to do very well, but the the amount of work and progress that he's been able to make in an incredibly short time, I think is 100 percent due to this place of trust and these 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 sure places, if you will, from a from a climbing analogy that he knows he can put weight on and, and push off and he knows we've got there. We've got his back. So it's been a pleasure. It, it, it's certainly not a set it and forget it environment, is it? I mean, it, it's just, you know, support, <laughs> whatever you want to call it, advice, support, you know, it, it's just really, really required. And a lot of that is the speed, the multiple disruptions we're living through, the speed of those disruptions, even, I was going to say first time CEOs, even, you know, veteran CEOs haven't seen what we're, what we're seeing now. And so to, you know, to to just think that it's, you know, kind of hands off, stay out of the way. I don't, I don't hear that from clients very much. Not so much. Yeah. Well, that, that wouldn't jive with your stat that 70% of value creation comes from the right leader, right? So. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> yep. Yep. Back to, back to, back to the statistics. So 54% of our PE respondents and 53% of Portco CEOs said that, that they, um, they're about halfway confident that they have the right leaders in place. This could be around right skills. It could be around right people. Does this number seem low to you? Is it is it echoing what you're seeing? What is the confidence that that CEOs and investors have that they have that right person in those critical value creating roles? This is now broader than just the C-suite. Value creation, of course, can happen anywhere in the organization, not just at senior levels, but Talk a little bit about, you know, is the right talent available? Is it about getting the talent? Is it about making sure it's against the right goals? What are you seeing? I'm going to take this one, Lane, or do you? Okay. Um, yeah, when I when I when I read this, I was like, yeah, that number seems right to me. Um, but I think the context really matters. And I was thinking about like, what would a great number be? Like if I were to do this within Carlisle would I want that number to be 100%? Because let's say the number was 100%, like, would that mean that all of our companies were perfectly poised to, to execute or more likely that they're just not thinking critically about what the next phase of their business will require from a, from a talent standpoint? So I think 50-ish is 54, 53 is, is, is right. And I think there's almost like two buckets of people that are that are saying no to this question, right? Like many of the most thoughtful CEOs that, I work with would would say no to this um, because they're continually playing a game of like, I'd call it maybe capability whack-a-mole, right? As the needs of their business evolve, um, they're they're evolving their talent along with it. What one of the most effective CEOs I work with has told me that he upgrades his leadership, he outgrows his leadership team every two to three years, given the pace of wow. change in, in that business. And this is an, an, an edge case, but I think a really interesting one in the context of this question. So that that CEO would say no to this question, but mm -hmm. I don't view it as a sign of a, a problem, right? I view mm -hmm. it as more his inclination to do really rigorous assessment on kind of what what the next phase will require. So you like there's I think there's some of those types of executives here who are always going to say no, 
And then of course you have the other half, which is, you know, maybe the more in the more classic sense. Like when when we do an investment at Carlisle, we are maniacal about understanding talent gaps really early in the investment. We we call it knowing the knowable faster. Um, and then making sure that we have an eye into, okay, knowing what we know about the value creation plan, what gaps need to be filled really, really, really quickly. Um, and so I, I think the answer is always going to be no. If, if anything, I could see it being higher. It's more about being really focused about where where specifically the answer absolutely has to be yes, or you need to be making a change soon. Um, and I mean, to Ted, to your point on, on finding the talent, um, I think the market is getting a little bit less frothy than than it was than it was a year a year ago, but it you know can, continues to be challenging, especially for I think CFO CHRO searches are, are some of the hardest we're doing right now. Yeah, yeah, uh, I, I agree with that too. Maybe taking the in, investor side of it, right? So the fifty four percent of PE respondents who who respond, you know, I, I also think there's an element you know, kind of inherent in in thoughtful deal partners where, you know, they're kind of, you know, perpetually unsatisfied, right? Yeah. So it, there could also be an element of, well, yes, we this has been, you know, as expected, or this person's been, you know, fine at this, but deficient at this. So, you know, I, I'm not sure I have the right leader in place. There's, there's you know, probably an element of that. But um, I think, Danny, maybe to, to push a little harder on something you touched on is, I also think there's you know, there's there's kind of what what good leadership looks like, which you can draw some general parallels, right? The growth mindset, finding a players, empowering people, holding them accountable, et cetera. Um, but I also think kind of per different either life cycles of a company, but also stages of the economy, right? Stages of the industry. There are different skill sets that are more valuable at different times. So, you know, as we've kind of pivoted into this, uh, let's say the precipice on the edge of, of a recession, which is maybe where we live right now. Um, you know, that's a different skill set than a go, go, go growth, right? And that was a different skill set than, um, you know, the COVID crisis, right? So I think there's also different, you know, the, you know, different leaders need to spike in different ways to be able to pivot and react um, and take advantage of different kind of macro, you know, situations that are going on. So, you know, depending on kind of when this this survey was asked, you know, what was the what was kind of the macro situation and was that different than, you know, perhaps the six months before meaning was a deal partner looking at her portfolio and saying, man, I've got, you know, like three leaders were great for the post COVID crisis, you know, boom, boom times, but they do not know how to cut costs here. So, or they don't know how to accelerate and, you know, become more competitive through a downturn. So I think there's, there's, there's an element of time and there's an element of, you know, kind of general skepticism by the deal partners with whom we, we work every day. So to kind of a question on that, Lane, because I, 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 I keep having these interactions with CEOs and I keep waiting for them or waiting for us to have the conversation about right person, right role, changing role, what's the right person. And I feel like, you know, they or he or she keeps like relying on what happened before and what what got them there as opposed to, you know, again, we're living in just such a highly disruptive world. Is that is that part of your criteria for kind of how you evaluate CEOs, whether they're get on their front foot and they're looking ahead and it's like, you know, they were they were good as a growth player here, but they don't know how to cut costs there or because I'm I'm seeing that I'm seeing there's a lag, even in some otherwise fine senior leaders. I'm seeing that there's a lag and then therefore that question about are you confident that you have the right people in the right role it becomes a, a tricky question well yes i am but it's not said with a lot of conviction yeah no i i love that i love that question ted because i think that's where you know over gosh my certainly past kind of four or five years in private equity including last year and a half with with omers we talk about that a lot i mean what is you know are, are, you know, it's kind of like, are we expecting too much of our CEOs? Do they have to be this, you know, perfect talent producer, this perfect, you know, pivot to any weird situation, you know, like, you know, is this a unicorn that just doesn't exist type of person, right? So, um, and you mentioned this in your preamble, but therefore think about the management team as, as a unit, right? And as long as you've got someone on the management team that kind of, you know, knows how to take the reins and lead everyone through, you know, a difficult cost cutting period, as long as you've got, you know, a smart um, sales and marketing person who knows how to, you know, grab share, right, aggressively during, you know, during a downturn, right, you, you know, they're, they're, they're kind of, you can, you can use the entire management team as, as a chessboard to set yourself up, 
you know, to, to be able to win. And I think, you know, broadening your expectations for, for folks kind of over and above the CEO means you then put more emphasis on two qualities. One, a growth mindset to be able to learn and know what they don't know. And two, be a talent spotter, right? So, so to be a CEO to say, okay, yes, I need to have this person on my team and I need to empower them um, and hold them accountable, but empower them when stuff gets rocky. I've got to have my CFO, you know, right at my shoulder and, and kind of leading. And I will give up, you know, more of my reins to that person in this type of situation. And, that, you know, that level of confidence and trust. Um, and that level of a growth mindset, knowing what you don't know and knowing what you need to learn, I think are the things that we're really over-indexing on um, in terms of what we want out of a CEO, just, just because it is, you know, kind of a, a lead javelin catcher type of, you know, type of role in this day and age, right? Yeah. Uh, so maybe that's a good segue into the next question. Can I just, can I just, can I, can I, can I ask you, I just, I need to ask this one question, but I also know that Danny had a comment. So Danny, you want to go first? Sure. No, I, I was just going to, I was going to agree with Lane whole, wholeheartedly. Um, you know, it's, it's really a, it's a mosaic of capability that goes well beyond the CEO. And then it's on the CEO kind of to recognize the needs. Um, a big way we are getting at this question. So going beyond kind of, do you have the right leaders in place? Yes or no is thinking about what, um, what capabilities will the company need when you think about the road ahead? Like what are things that organizationally you're going to need to do that you're not doing well now? Or, or not doing at all um, and, and filling it against that. So really kind of priori prioritizing and almost kind of heat mapping where, where we are and what's really gonna matter um, as the uh, overall context changes. And, and, and that's great. And Joanne, I'm sorry to jump in like this, but there's just one follow-on question that I really wanna get Lane and, and, um, and Danny and your yeah. perspective on, because it keeps happening to me like over the last several months, I've encountered separate CEOs engaged in dramatic change, trying to figure out the leadership question, trying to figure out the people question, and they are gripped by loyalty. They are gripped by people that were with them when they started the company 20 years ago. And, it, and you, given the value creation thesis, given where everything has gone, that loyalty sadly is misplaced. How, how do you work with with senior level leaders, CEOs, and other C-suite leaders that are um, that are too loyal to their people, if I can use that phrase. Yeah, I think that's one of the toughest situations that we face um, because you know the folks who were loyal, right? They they were in the war with you. They went through, you know, they were there day one when you know the. You, can think of the Jerry Maguire scene where they walk out with the goldfish, right? So, um, you know, and and frankly. More often than not, the folks um, whom the leader is loyal to have done nothing differently or wrong, right? To right. to to right. disearn the loyalty, right? So that I mean, right. and you know, as a human being, that just it doesn't feel right. It doesn't feel good to you know to to you know reward right that type of uh, longevity and that type of relationship, right? With a you know with a pink slip or a boot in the rear end, um, so. What, you know, kind of what we try to do, obviously, is kind of keep the humanity, you know, first and foremost in, in everyone's mind, you know, A, and, and you know, B, there's there's a way to treat people well, right, on the way out, right? The, at the end of the day, you know, my my fiscal responsibility my, is to, you know, our pensioners, right? And that's, that's what I have to kind of remember on a day-to-day -day basis. And, um, you know, my fiduciary responsibility. And so, you know, doing the right thing for the growth of the company is kind of my job, but you know, removing your humanity and, and treating people poorly who have, who have been, you know, great soldiers, you know, on the journey is, is you know, it, it certainly keeps me up at night. And there's, you know, you just have to keep keep your humanity in mind and, and, and you know, treat the exit in the most respectful, thoughtful way possible. Have people leave with their dignity intact. And I think that's really what the key is, right? And, you know, I think about this question and let's face it, in the best of times, making people decisions to exit them is on the bottom of the list of most leaders because it is the most challenging, right? Because it is having to let go of something. Um, and I think some of that is also a self-acknowledgement, especially if you were involved in bringing them in, that maybe you made the wrong decision. And so anytime I find that working with clients, it's very difficult to have them make the decision to say, you know, Sally Sue, 
Mary Lou, Billy Bob are not the right folks anymore. And I need to figure out how to go make that happen. And, you know, as one of the some sage advice that I got when I was an operator taking over a very troubled business unit was you need to know within the first 30 days who you're keeping and who you're letting go of. And if you still have them around after a very, very short horizon window, um, you need to then start looking at yourself to see, like, do you really have what you need in order to go do the needful, the hard work, the heavy lift, because your talent that you have going into this isn't going to get you there. And I always have that in my mind every time, even when I work with clients today as an advisor or when I've taken on other operational roles is, you know, first and foremost, yes, I need to understand the financials and the business and my customers and what have you, but I've got to very rapidly assess multiple levels down. Do we have the right talent profile and the people that can go make whatever needs to happen, happen? Yeah. It's not um, easy. Not, no, it's, it's, it's not easy. And I think that in most businesses, not every business, but most businesses, they're, they're just our sacred cows. And there's a certain amount of social capital that boards and investors are willing to spend on slaughtering those sacred cows versus keeping them. And I think kind of acknowledging who, who they are and understanding why, why they're in that position. Most CEOs, when they're really loyal to someone, it's because they've delivered for them in a really meaningful way in the past. And so in some instances, it does make sense to, to exit that person. In other instances, maybe it's just maybe it's just a different role. And maybe it's kind of understanding what are the superpowers that makes this person so compelling and so sticky for that CEO and how how can we how can we apply them elsewhere? Um, and when it does come time to, to making the, the hard decision, we try to stay incredibly fact-based and maybe have a healthy level of anxiety and understanding what value leakage would occur if we were to keep this person in in the seat. So kind of here's, here's what needs to be done. What, what evidence do we have that this person can in fact deliver on what you're saying kind of overall, Mr. and Mrs. CEO, um, are, are, are you willing to, to sign your name against that, that gap, um, yeah. which can often get them there. Yeah. That's so very helpful. Can I pivot now, Ted? Are you good? Please. I'm good. <laughs> <laughs> so now that we've got the CEO and she's there making decisions and letting uh, some folks go, needing to replace some and deciding on who's to say, stay. In our survey, the Port Co. executive said that recruiting and retaining talent is their number one challenge that they face. So we've talked a little bit about this and some of the answers, but what are you seeing and what have you learned as you've been working with your Port Co.'s, if you will, and investments? Um, in the current challenges around talent, how has it impacted your talent evaluation or even the practices? And I know both of you covered this just a little bit, but maybe if you can say something as it relates to working with the deal teams and what they're thinking about, and are you putting in place more upfront evaluations or understanding of that management team going into an investment and, and getting approval for that? And let's go with you, Danny. Do you want to uh, begin? Yeah. Um, looking at management teams early in the investment uh, it has, has become table stakes for us. Um, and it also, I think CEOs have come to appreciate the amount of time and resource we put into that exercise because it shows that we're really seeking to understand and, and put in put in the hours and the sweat equity to, to kind of have a real conversation with them around, around talent instead of, you know, yeah, during the management presentation, these folks didn't show up very well. Let's, let's make, let's make a choice. And so um, that, that management assessment, ab absolutely critical for us. Um, I would say that for Carlisle, we're, we're broadly seeing way more focus on talent in, in the boardroom from, from a leadership, but, but also a workforce perspective. So boards have always wanted visibility into this stuff and kind of a full talent picture, but I'm now seeing folks look much more systematically at succession, at the recruiting and retention numbers. They really have a pulse on kind of who the critical talent are with the same level of rigor as they would any other operational or, or financial metric. Um, I know, Lane, you said that you guys work with a lot of services businesses, so, so do we. And I think that in, in businesses where that human supply chain is really the, the make or break and kind of the, the unlock to growth, um, we're seeing intense focus on using data to, to inform workforce talent decisions and, and do talent management. Um, I've worked with 
several of our, our companies to understand and to kind of codify from a psychometric perspective what are the indicators most associated with their with their best people in, in mission critical roles. And now they're using that data to inform who they hire, how they how they performance manage, and kind of where where they're setting that that bar of excellence for, for the critical roles in the organization. So much, much more data driven. And a lot of companies are now asking us to, to do that work with them instead of us recommending it. Um, one of one of our portfolio companies, HireView, uh, has a lot of tools that um, help companies make more data-driven, more efficient, um, unbiased decisions when it comes to talent. So many of our companies are, are choosing to work with them. Great. That's wonderful. That's great. Right? Yeah, I, I think we're, we're maybe one kind of tangible thing that we've started to do on a consistent basis is um, ensure that the CHRO role is not the, you know, yes, very important to make sure the benefits are good, make sure the, you know, paychecks get out on time, et cetera. But but, but kind of pivoting that role to a, you know, shoulder to shoulder, toe to toe with the CEO, you know, kind of COO level type, you know, part of the trifecta leader, right? So a highly strategic at the table leader who's bringing, you know, again, we're mostly most of our assets walking out of the door every day, right? We don't make widgets. Um, so, you know, having the, that people person at the table focused on people and talent and recruitment, et cetera, um, from that strategic perspective. And it's not, you know, it's, you know, again, toe to toe with the CEO, it's a, it's a, it is one of the key deputies. So that's, so that's something we've really focused on. I think, um, similarly, especially with more, our more kind of gray collar slash blue collar type of services businesses, you know, the wharf of talent is has been brutal, right? At the kind of all across. So I love what you're talking about, Danny, with the kind of psychometrics. I've done that at a couple other portfolio companies in, in past lives, but we're also starting to kind of train your own and recruit your own, right? So partnerships with, with technical colleges, partnerships with, um, you know, kind of undiscovered, let's say untapped sources of talent and then bringing folks in to train them. So we're getting out of that kind of doom loop uh, from an entry level to say, you know, you only get hired into this role if you've done it before. And then people are saying, well, <laughs> how can I have done it before if I, you know, so, and so they, you know, they're kind of throwing their hands up and you know what, fair enough. So we're, we're kind of starting our own, you know, let's train our own folks type things. And, you know, there's a, there's a risk that that then, then you become a source for your competitors to just pick people off. Um, the training which, the street. <laughs> that's exactly you're training the street. So that's, um, you know, something to kind of keep in mind. But I think the the need was so acute, right, over during the kind of war for talent year and a half that we're probably still in, but certainly we're experiencing acutely uh, in the past was such that it was it was worth it to kind of set up these machines for for our, a couple of our companies. Yeah, and to go back to a point Lane said about kind of the, the role of the CHRO, like over the past three years, the role of the chief people officer has just become so much more mission critical, so much more visible. I think if we were to advocate for a COO chief people officer pre, pre-COVID, um, many CEOs got it, many, many did not. And so now as, you know, through through the past three years, kind of every aspect of the employee experience and kind of talent market got renegotiated, right? And so the role of this individual and the strategic role that they can play, it's it's no longer optional. Um, and so we've seen a lot of companies not only recognizing a need to, to have the right person and an upgraded person in that seat, but also really a pulse on how to, how to use them and how to put them to work. One of the things we've seen is a dramatic in, increase in succession planning. And I think that's kind of an all of the above kind of reason that the, the, the longer hold times, the various disruptions that we're going through for work for generations in the workforce. I, you know, it's it's I think we're on our sixth or seventh succession planning assignment um, this year alone. And I, I, I think that the other exciting thing that we've done is to use you know, both psychometrics and behavioral interviewing around defining who are the top performers and how do you then hire those more of those? How do you both, you know, create and develop, but also taking that to the selection process and the recruitment process? And how do you make more of those high performers? So there's a lot that's going on, I think, in this whole field of of leadership and talent management that is trying to make the war for talent more, uh, more winnable. So can I ask an adjacent question a bit, um, you know, as we think about needing to acquire, retain, uh, and, 
you know, commitments to ESG. I, I think of ESG well beyond, you know, a, a DNI type focus or or what have you. But as you're working with your port co's, how are you talking with them, or what are you hearing from them as it relates to in the talent evaluation and retention and bringing in new people, a real focus and commitment into diversity, and I would I would say more importantly inclusion because it's the inclusion that's going to drive the stay right and the belonging um lane how about for for omers uh, how is that being addressed or what are you hearing back from some of the the port codes yeah i mean we're you know i wouldn't i wouldn't call us necessarily on the kind of bleeding edge of you know esg in general or um or dni specifically but it's i think there's a kind of my observation via our portfolio is we there's a a, a universal acceptance of the the factual truth that to have a a diverse team creates more value, right? More value more quickly. Um, so I think kind of that that battle, right? That that let's say we fought ten years ago is you know we can per- potentially start to focus less on that, right? We won't call it right. one because it's a stupid thing. It's to not say. one. <laughs> um, yeah, but, but so I think there's, you know, a general acceptance, right? Where I think as I started, you know, the ESG conversations, you know, years and years ago, that that was the big hump we were starting to get over. Um, a, B, I think one thing that that where I've seen ESG programs and, and DNI programs fall down uh, in the past is when it wasn't linked to, you know, EBITDA, frankly, our, our industry private equity, right, is one that kind of falls and rises based on whether or not you've, you know, expanded revenues and or shrunk costs, right? So did you create EBITDA, you know, period, right. end of statement. And, um, you know, as I said, we, we I think we can all kind of collectively agree that, that, that these types of programs do increase EBITDA. Um, and as I mentioned, the you know, majority of our portfolio companies are people businesses. So doing things to enhance um, retention, right? That's those are dollars, right? That's dollars and cents at the end of the day. That is a person I did not have to recruit. I did not have to train. You know, I did not have to explain where the bathroom is and how to turn on your computer, right? There's so much benefit in having folks who are good um, stay at the firm and you know, kind of create value and do what they do and, and flourish at the firm. So I think um, you know the way that we have designed our ESG program. Um, in a good way, has has really sought to ensure that all the the DNI programs and the ESG programs in general are linked to to EBITDA outcomes, right, and not independent of that. Because I think that's where you know some of the the kind of ethereal stuff, which you know probably still really important, can fall down for folks who at the end of the day, or you know, they judge themselves based on whether or not they they moved you know one number. So, so we. We have a we have a question from our LinkedIn audience that I would love to put to our panel, and it's it's uh, um, a, a question near and dear uh, to my heart. Joanne, do you want to ask it? Yeah, I would love to. So, uh, for those of you that uh, may not be aware, but we are live streaming as well on LinkedIn, and from that audience, we have uh, the question: In how difficult is it to build the right culture when there is so much disruption? Great question. <laughs> Short answer: extremely difficult. <laughs> I think. Well, anyway, that, that an easy, an easy and difficult, you know, shrug to a to a very serious question. Um, maybe I'll I'll answer it to say I think the the places where we've had uh, leaders who who kind of su- succeeded most through through huge disruption have trained their companies um, to embrace change, right? This is this is what we do. So, you know, feeling kind of the curveballs coming from all around and having that shake you um, and have that be something, you know, that that kind of stresses you out and keeps you up at night versus uh, helping a company shift their mindset and shift the culture to where they expect things to come in from. They expect curveballs, they expect change. And, and I think that's where I've seen the most success. It's, it's easy to say, it's, a, it's very difficult to do, um, but I think, you know, a kind of a leadership expectation of cultural change at the top where you're preparing the organization to, you know, to catch these curveballs as they come to, and to, to shift the organization's mindset to, you know, kind of embrace the change um, is, is kind of, you know, it, it's, it's, it's not, you know, 
not not as kind of specific bullet point examples, but you you know when you see that and you see a leader doing that in the right way, it feels very different. You can really tell when the culture is one that embraces change versus versus is scared of change. Yeah, absolutely. We we often say that kind of change is not a function. It's it's a feature of every single person's job. And so re recognizing that mandate and responsibility from the top to bottom of the organization, kind of how, what, what role do you have to play in the change that we are navigating can give folks a sense of agency and, and control um, when there's a lot of change. Uh, I know there was some some data in uh, that came back in your survey about burnout and how kind of that that theme has has increased um, over the, since the last time you filled the survey. Um, I think that can be also an element of when people talk about kind of tough, tough culture in, in an environment with, with so much change. We see this theme in some of the employee surveys that, that we do and often find that it does come back to some combination of prioritization, communications, and leadership. And so it's, you know, either way too many priorities, it's shifting priorities, it's unclear priorities. And so when we think about um, culture transformation and kind of providing that sense of security to to the organization, it often does stem back to leadership and communications. And so really having clarity on what's the game we're trying to win and how, how are we going to win it together? Yeah. And how I mean, do I as an individual impact yes. that, right? Yeah. Right. I right. always say that until folks <laughs> understand how this changes impacts me personally, that's all their head is going to be swimming with, and they're not really going to be able to contribute in a meaningful way to advancing the ball on an organizational level. So in addressing that me as quickly as possible and kind of em empowering that me to, to be part of it can, can be a, a big step forward, but, but, but that, not a perfect answer. Yeah, no, that's incredible. And, and I think, you know, culture is driven by leadership and leadership behaviors. So we define culture as shared values, shared beliefs, and shared behaviors. And it begins with the executive leadership team. And they need to understand how they're showing up, what they're saying, and how they're walking the talk of the values of the organization. And then as you say, Danny, each person needs to understand not just that they need to have their own version of that, but why answering that fundamental why question, why do I need to do this? And that, you know, if, if successful, that can actually help retain and attract talent. That's so true. One of our best CEOs says, I want to say the same thing 4 million times. And if yeah. I fall into the game where I'm saying 4 million things one time, like we're the whole, we're, we've lost. <laughs> we're done. Yeah. And if you're not tired of saying it, no one has heard you yet. That's uh, right. <laughs> And even if you are, they might not have. Yeah, <laughs> All right. Well, I know we're um, going to wrap here. Um, we're near time. So with that, um, I would love to ask Lane, is there anything in closing you'd like to add? No, Did you I'm, think I'm, about I'm, PE yeah. leadership and, and the impact back to performance? Thank you. No, I, I would just like to to thank both both you and Ted. I mean, I know you know Ted has been has been beating this leadership drum for <laughs> a long time. I won't throw a number out, Ted, but um, <laughs> and I think you know finally our industry is catching up to you know what Ted's always been saying and how important it is to be thoughtful, you know, about getting you know the right the right folks in the right seats at the right time. Uh, and um, you know, as as I, I kind of mentioned earlier in our conversation, I mean, this I spend eighty percent of my time doing this now which when I started in this industry, you know, 15, 15 long years ago, this, this was not the, this is not the way I distorted my time. So this is, you know, we've, we've kind of really matured as an industry. Great. And Danny, anything you'd like I'll to just, say in closing? I'll just echo Lane's thanks. Um, this has been such a great conversation and just appreciate both, both of your partnership. Ted, thank you yeah. so much, Danny. Thank yeah, Ted, thank anything you. Anything from you? No, just special thanks to, to Lane and to Danny and to you, Joanne. This has been a really wonderful conversation. Thanks to everybody online. It's been great. Absolutely. Thank you to the audience. Thank you for the questions. I know we haven't been able to get to a couple of them as we close out. Again, Lane, McDonald, Danny, Levy, thank you very much for your generosity and time with us to participate in this panel. Ted, always a pleasure to be with you. Um, it's such great uh, opportunity to be in your presence and to talk with you. Feel free to keep the conversation going with us. You can post out on LinkedIn. We'll have the recording available there as well as the link out to the leadership survey. So again, it's the eighth annual private equity leadership survey. Uh, we look forward to continuing the conversation and thank you again for your time and participation. Have a wonderful day.